Welcome. <laughs> we'll get started. Uh, so this is Power to the People, how uh, using containers can make your life easier. But this is not a technical talk. Uh, so if you're looking for details, gory details of actually using containers and Docker and all those things, uh, we're not going into that right now. So if you are expecting technical and want to find another session right now, that's perfectly fine. So. Yeah, it's cool. Um, welcome to our talk. Um, I'm Bastian. I'm a system engineer at Amazee.io. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Dasrecht. Um, I'm one of the people who have way too many side projects. So I also am part of TEDx Burn, like the locally run TEDx community. Um, I do DevOps Days Zurich. So if you want to speak at DevOps Days Zurich next year, I'm here. Um, I just started doing an open air cinema because it's nice in summer and you can do stuff outside. And I at least forgot a lot of things. Uh, I'm Tyler Ward. Um, I am also a system engineer at Maze.io. Um, I'm a former Drupal developer uh, for various agencies um, like Bastion. Too many hobbies to list. Um, but uh, at home, I am an organizer for the Pacific Northwest Drupal Summit. Uh, so if any of you would like to come and speak, Portland would love to see you there. Cool. Um, yeah, then let's get into like the agenda, what we, are, what we will be talking today. First, we will cover like what containers are and what they are not, because the what they are not part is also important. Then we cover um, benefits and pitfalls because there are a lot of ways of doing Docker the wrong way and we will share our experience we had uh, along the way. We will go into the journey we had uh, with Docker in production. Um, we will talk and touch briefly on the uh, containers in the future, like where we see containers going in the next few years. We talk then about uh, specific Drupal container tools, and in the end, we will have ample time to have a little bit of a discussion and cover your questions. So starting off with what containers are not. Um, containers are not a virtual machine or server, though the end result sometimes is presented that way. Um, when you build containers the correct way, um, you have a container doing a specific task for a specific amount of time. Um, not a long-running virtual machine or server like we're so used to seeing. Um, containers are not Docker, though Docker is containers. There are other containerization systems, um, though you will hear us use containers Docker very interchangeably. Um, there's a lot of other ways to do it out there, as well as some coming in the future um, as well. Um, just using containers is not going to solve problems for you. Um, it's not magic. Uh, it's a lot more work than magic. Um, so you can't just start using containers um, on your systems or on your local workstation and expect it to fix all kinds of things for you. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, and having containers or Docker or any of those things um, is not going to magically get you um, to being DevOps or not that type of situation. Um, in fact, it's um, requires a lot more effort than just installing something and suddenly you're, you know, it, it helps with enabling um, developers and operations working together, but it's not um, going to solve all of those problems. Um, containers are, um, they're very small, um, they're very fast, they're lightweight um, because of how we build them. Um, they, they share resources, so um, with Docker, um, in a VM you have all of these things inside of one server. Um, we bring in a Docker engine there, um, container engine, um, again, using those interchangeably. Um, and we share all of these things like the system kernel, firewalls, networking, file sharing, all those things are brought into each container. So you no longer have to manage those. Your, your service can be your service and nothing more. Um, because they are small and lightweight, they're just running one thing, it makes it more secure. Um, when you're running containers the right way, the, the process that's running in there only has access to the bare minimum that it needs to function. So you can't um, you know, go into that container and see everything else that's running on 
the system that that that's hosting that um, it can only see maybe a socket file that it can connect to to get access to another service. Um, and then you have orchestration systems, um, Docker Swarm, uh, OpenShift, that help enforce security there and make sure the containers have what they need to do their job when they die and come back. Um, another thing that helps with security is that you build the containers off of images and images are immutable. If you change something inside of one of these containers, you can destroy it and bring it back. It's back to the same state. Nothing's changed. Somebody, you know, finds a security vulnerability or, uh, you know, in Drupal and you're running it inside of a container and they manage to change something in what appears to them to be PHP, uh, you can fix your problem in Drupal, replace the container, and you've solved the security problem there. Yeah, um, for those in the back, there is still a row up front if you want to come forward. <laughs> Thanks. We'll take on our friends. <laughs> yeah, all our friends. Cool, yeah, I'm now focusing a little bit on the benefits and pitfalls uh, when it comes to Docker. And that's one really good quote from Bridget, which speaks a lot in the DevOps uh, community. So. Using containers will not fix your broken culture. Take that in mind. It will not just, you will not just magically uh, land somewhere where like, wow, everything works now and we just switch on containers. So the tech stuff is rather easy. The human part is, is hard. So humans resist to change and if you just come and say, hey, we have containers now, not everybody will embrace that with uh, or like let that happen just easily. Um, just put a lot of effort into making sure that <laughs> you make it as easy as possible for people to get started with. Um, another thing is like because Docker images basically are a layered system, you need to put a lot of effort into thinking how the hierarchy should work. Because if you have bad base images which do a lot and change all the time, you will have a lot of time waiting for your builds to finish. Um, so try to map out first what you want to achieve and then start to basically find the way how to make your images as small as possible. Um, another thing is you should really not reinvent the wheel. Um, try to base off from well-known and well-maintained images like Alpine or CentOS because they come with most of the things we need on a daily basis. You can every, uh, build everything your own, but you will spend a lot of time maintaining that stuff. Of course, it's a little bit creepy, let's say it that way, um, just using work from somebody else, but hey, that's basically how we do it with Drupal and like just using Composer and pull in all the things. Um, if you have a properly set up CI system, you should not be worried about just pulling in an external dependency, but, but when that would break, your CI system would inform you and say, hey, there's something broken and it would just not deploy. Another thing is, if you just have your monolithic system and you roll that up in a container, it's still a monolithic system. There's a way to do that. You can do that with Docker, but you should really not do that. And when you start to use containers, like let's say you have 100 servers and then you start building everything in microservices and you go crazy and you end up with like 700 microservices and containers and it floats around, um, you need to be very good at the operational part because your problems will scale with the amount of containers you start. If something goes wrong, it just goes wrong in a lot of different places and it just starts to bubble up everywhere. So a lot of um, things that currently work and we like monitoring, it's just not holding up when you start to use containers. Um, the thing is I mentioned, I just mentioned this, you need to monitor correctly. What does that mean? I mean, when we had a server back in the day, we'd, uh, we knew that, okay, there is, an Nginx on top of it, so we just monitor that Nginx somehow, and you really knew what to do. And now you just have containers starting, and you just don't, like the systems are currently not that sophisticated to just go in and see, oh, there is 
uh, there is an nginx and I just monitor that because that container might just fade away and we need to know when an error is really an error because it, it would leave you with a lot of false errors if you approach monitoring the old way. Um, another thing is storing logs is really hard because as I mentioned, a container might just disappear or die and be re rescheduled by, the, um, by your system and you might not have catched the last error which would lead you to the solution of the problem. So the whole log storage and how to deal with logs is also really complicated. And KISS, like the, the really simple things, like the operational things, like oh yeah, just go in and restart the service, get really hard if you have the service scattered around in dozens of containers. But there are also benefits. Um, the problem that you push something and it works perfectly and beautifully on your local machine and it hits production and everything falls apart, it's basically fading away because the builds you run on your local machine are exactly the same as you run in the cloud. So there is no configuration difference between those. You might have uh, flipped a few things via environment variables, but the software as like, and your code is exactly the same. And another cool thing is it's platform independent. So you build it on a Mac, you run it on a, on a Linux uh, server, it doesn't really matter. Um, sharing is caring. So if you have um, your developers adding a lot of features like changing or adding Redis to, to your Drupal site and they commit that and somebody else pulls, they just run Docker Compose up and it will start the container and also add Redis. So like you gain from the work which is put into it a lot more than if you would need to say, oh, if you, if you want to use that branch, please also install Redis on your local machine. So you just have a container and it will automatically start. Um, speed is also very important things. Back in the days when we developed on Vagrant machines, like to start a Vagrant machine took like, okay, it needs to download an image there goes my first coffee and then you do the provisioning and it takes like five to 10, 15 minutes until you have something to work with. And with Docker, you can just say, I want to work now and it downloads the image that takes probably 30 seconds and then it just starts it. And after you've downloaded the image, you have it locally and you just spawn it in seconds. And you can also remove it in seconds. Um, it means also more flexibility, as I mentioned, you can add uh, Redis or you can update the PHP version and change the things uh, on your project and it's just working and you give a lot of power to your developers. Whereas in the old days or like on all the infrastructure, you would need to talk to the IT department and say, okay, we want to upgrade to Varnish 4 and we might want to have PHP 7.2 and things like that. And you can basically just build that into your Docker. And yeah, operations is becoming a software development skill because basically everything you build in that Docker image is basically what the developers define. So you need to hold the developers a little bit accountable on what they bake into the images. Yeah, but you can also have a lot of fun with Docker. So um, I set out at some point and was like, ah, I want I went through my week and I looked at my bash history, what I usually run, like I run Ansible and it was like, oh, I could run Ansible in a Docker container because I don't wanna have Ansible installed locally. Or if I, if I travel by train, I also want to have a YouTube video um, to watch sometimes and I just wrap the YouTube download binary into a Docker container because it's easier to just share it. And I was like, Tyler asked me, hey, how do you download those, uh, those YouTube videos and say, Here's the Docker container, just run it this way and it downloads it. Um, some of you might know TinyCurl terminal. It's basically, um, you just throw a lot of Git repositories at it and it shows you, it's perfect for standups. Uh, it shows what you committed today, it pulls the weather from Twitter and it's like a small dashboard you can use. And it's a Node.js thing and I was like, I don't want to install Node.js on my machine. So I wrapped this in like five, 10 minutes into a Docker container and it runs beautifully. Uh, you can go crazy and install Firefox into a Docker container and run it. You, so you're not bound to 
just having a server there, you can also have um, applications which need a, a user interface spun up in a Docker container. Or if you want to go really crazy, you can run Docker in Docker. So if you want to build crazy stuff, what we sometimes do, um, you want to run Docker in Docker, and you can basically find it on uh, Docker Hub that it's posted. <coughs> Right, so our journey, the Amazio journey um, into containers, um, uh, not an easy journey. Um, it's taken about eight, about eight years to, to get to where we are through four different generations of our hosting platform. Um, the first one is, was built <coughs> like a lot of companies, um, completely in-house. Uh, why should we trust someone else's work? Uh, they don't do it the same way we want it done. Um, it, works, but it also means a lot of maintenance and upkeep, and you have to have people to build it for you um, on your staff. Uh, we went from there to having an external company um, to then take that over and then improve upon it, replace portions, and so on, um, which is good and bad. You know, we, we now have a team we're working with to, to take care of all those things, um, but still uh, built by us and them, not relying or not using a lot of the work, there's you know, large communities that can share their work, um, which is what the third one was, is we started using Puppet and Ansible, we'll bringing in all sorts of modules and plugins and tools from those communities to build and manage the uh, hosting infrastructure, um, which we're still operating right now, though we're not adding to it, where everything we're doing is now going into the fourth uh, generation of our hosting platform. Um, which is entirely based on all sorts of containers and microservices. Um, we recently open sourced that, it's called Lagoon. You can find it on our GitHub as well. Um, so you can take those things and actually build your own. You can skip the first three steps uh, and build your own hosting company at step number four. Um, so what is actually going from generation three to generation four look like. Um, we had to start somewhere, so the first problem we wanted to solve was that local development problem. Uh, so we took all of our Puppet and Ansible code and we built Docker images off of it. Now we were doing it the wrong way because it was a monolith. Um, all of the services that the Drupal site needed to run were in a single Docker image. They weigh in at like 1.2 gigs. Um, but everything was there, everything's running, so it was a great step in. Um, once we had that going, automation around that so we can build and push new images so all of the developers we work with can get those, get the updates right away, we started building our accessory services uh, into Docker. So we put Solar in. We needed to be able to easily update to new versions of Solar, so we added Docker to our servers to be able to run the Solar service of whichever version we need on those servers and give our clients <coughs> easy access to the latest and greatest stuff. Um, and we brought back PHP 5.3. Uh, we had some old servers uh, that almost everyone was migrated off of, but we had a few clients who either didn't have the team or the budget or whatever reason, they had these Drupal 6 and 7 sites that needed PHP 5.3. So we were able to take, build them an image, and then put it in an isolated environment. So bringing back the security, it's an old unsupported version of PHP, it's not receiving updates anymore, but we're able to run it isolated, they're not risking any of our other clients or infrastructure, and it's in Docker, easy to take care of now. From there, um, it got really messy. We started uh, with the latest version of Jenkins, um, which adds pipeline support through the Jenkins files, using those tools to uh, start replacing our deployment system, um, building small microservices that would run as part of that. Um, and then we had to look at <coughs> orchestration of all these systems. Um, we settled on OpenShift, which is what Lagoon works with. Um, and Lagoon, um, if you come by our booth and see the demo, it's amazing, but it's close to a dozen and a half different microservices that work together. Each one does a very specific thing. They're all, primarily all um, <coughs> Node.js applications that run and can be replaced on the fly uh, to do a very specific job for a time that they're needed. So we're starting them up and tearing them down. 
as part of a deployment. Yeah, so I'll talk a little bit up about the future of containers, and as you can see, it's all about microservices. Um, so when we talk about containers, the, the approach as we go today, where you define everything basically in YAML files, in your code, um, that's basically the cloud native approach to s system engineering or application development, to say. Um, and this will become more and more the standard that we move away from basically having the systems on one side and the code on the other that basically everything is one thing. And if you want to change something, you just change it in code, you push it, and you will have your new changes, like having more um, backend systems and adding to those projects. Um, you gain a lot of flexibil flexibility through those things. Um, Another thing is that uh, if you saw Ranger, uh, Rancher OS, it's basically an operating system built around Docker, so every service is running in a Docker container. So it's not like systemd where everything on the Linux world is eaten up by systemd, everything is eaten up by Docker. Um, so that's really cool. Um, another thing is containers in a car, because cars are fairly complicated systems nowadays. Um, if you think about the Tesla, it, they are currently thinking about having a way to basically update their autopilot or update the navigation system. And how cool would it be when they can just ship a container via the, via the cell network to your car and spin it up again? I mean, they did something similar with the software update uh, lately in the States when people needed to go away. Um, to be evacuated uh, when the hurricanes came, they just added more battery capacity on the models that, which had a lower capacity. So they rolled out just an update. And if you think about this, uh, it's basically we can also just deploy a container to that. Um, a lot of work is also done on the Linux and on the Windows side. So we can now run Linux containers on Windows and we will soon be able to run the opposite, the opposite, like running Windows containers under Linux, because Microsoft is really heavily investing into containers and also into the interop uh, interoperability between those two worlds. So I never, I never thought that I will say that Microsoft is a cool open source company, but they are doing a lot. Um, another thing is that we will probably, even in five years' time, not talk about the Docker anymore, it will be just another um, technology, but the concept of a container will just stay. And as I mentioned earlier, operations will be a crucial part of every day's um, software development life. So just quickly, um, some of the companies that are using containers and doing uh, cool things aside from, from what we've mentioned. Um, Netflix, when they get new content, um, they are entirely using individual containers to do all the transcoding now. So they need a, you know, a, a stream for your Roku, they need a mobile version, they need uh, you know, 4K, all of those things. Each one of those, they start a container, a service to do that task. It finishes it, it, it sends it back to their you know, file system and then the container goes away. So the capacity is now freed up to do the next job. Um, they're not having long-running services uh, that, that consume resources when they don't need them. In fact, instead of watching for uptime, they watch for how short the uptime is, and if it exceeds a length, then they look at a problem. Instead of seeing it running too short uh, and thinking there's something wrong, they make sure they don't run for too long. Um, Visa is actually moving massive portions of their uh, transaction processing into containerized systems now. Um, hundreds of thousands of transactions being processed in various services, but they, it gains them the ability to scale. Um, that's because they can take an image and just start adding capacity across a large cluster of servers. Um, they have an easy way to scale to process all of their, their transactions. Um, year, two years ago now, I think, um, Alibaba, it's a uh, Chinese kind of equivalent to Amazon, um, large shopping service. Um, they have a large sale day called Singles Day. $12 billion in transactions they received. They'd never seen traffic like this before, but because they had 
all of the services they need to process the traffic to handle that built around containers and microservices, they were able to scale out the capacity in real time as they needed it to handle the, this impressive load. Um, and then in the Drupal world, um, there are a few of us that are running um, containers uh, in production. Um, Pantheon, um, they're not using Docker. Um, I believe it's LXC based. Um, they've been doing that since the beginning. Um, very solid system. Service breaks, they can replace the container. Site comes back to life. <clears throat> Platform um, is also, and they, they give you an amazing amount of flexibility using their containers that you get to choose from a wide variety of services to run inside of those. Um, and then of course, Amazi.io, we're also doing um, containers for Drupal hosting and Node.js and all of those services as well. Um, a few of the, the Drupal specific tools, um, won't go deep into them, but to give you an idea of what's out there. Um, the, the hardest one to use, but some people do, is just straight up Docker and Docker Compose commands. Um, it gets you going, uh, it provides a good base, but you do have to, there's a steep learning curve there. Um, Calibox has been around for a while, um, and they just released the newest version called Lando. Um, they've worked with Pantheon for a long time on that. Um, I believe the new version has um, a plugin for platform now, um, so they're expanding that to work with those providers um, to make it easy to develop their systems locally. You have easy access there. Um, Docker for Drupal, DDEV from uh, Drood, Outrigger is done by Phase 2 uh, in the US, um, and then ours is called Pygmy, or we have uh, another version called Cashlot, depending on what your needs. And the thing that all of these provide is they, they make it easy to bring this to your computer. So it takes care of the problems of DNS and a proxy so that you, you know, need to find out what container, what, you know, where your Drupal site is running locally. These tools all take care of connecting those dots together to make it easy for you to work locally, start up a container, work on your site, save, edit, reload, and then tear it down and stop using those resources when you're done working on that project or need to switch to a different version um, at the same time. It's basically the run through, um, so we have time for your questions about things you're doing or what we're doing or where things are headed. You guys are easy. <laughs> So um, it wouldn't be a DrupalCon session without mentioning that we are hiring. Um, we have two openings for system engineers who want to work around the UTC business time zone hours. You don't have to live there. We're a fully remote company. So if you're interested, uh, let us know. Thanks.